Delmarva Today with Don Rush. It will soon be one year since the Talbot Boy statue came down after being placed on the courthouse lawn in Easton. You're listening to Delmarva Today. This is Don Rush. There is a new project underway to document the battle entitled Monumental Struggle. Filmmaker is Mike Wickline. He is a producer and director at Magic Lantern based in Baltimore. We have on the phone this afternoon. Welcome to the program. Hi, Don, and thanks for asking me to join you. So like, give me a sense about how you got involved in this project. Okay. The, the thing that led me to this is when the Charlottesville uh, massacre, well, not, not massacre, when the Charlottesville riot happened uh, around the Lee Monument a few years ago, that got my attention. Um, I've been a student of the Civil War since I was five years old and done a lot of different Civil War projects, different video projects. And at that point, I thought, you know, I, maybe there's a documentary in this, something that gets into the history of these monuments and, and really deals with this subject. And, but I, at that point, I really didn't know how to approach it or where to, how to focus on it. <clears throat> and through a, a mutual friend, I ended up meeting Denise Lombard, who was became the chair of the Move the Monument Committee. And um, Denise, and, and 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 things things were pretty far along. Actually, I think the first time I talked to Denise, um, the monument had already been moved. It was a little bit after that last year, and um, she expressed an interest in in a documentary being made. So I talked with her, talked with some of the folks that she had been working with, and I thought, okay, I, I think Easton may be a good focus for me. So that's really how this came to be focused there. Give me a sense of what you got in terms of the history of this thing, because it was actually erected uh, uh, in, uh, around, I think, uh, 1916. Yeah, that's that's when the statue went on top of the pedestal. The pedestal was put there and. 2013 or 14, I, uh, not 20, in 1913 or 14. Right. And and that was that came about after the 50th anniversary Gettysburg reunion. And veterans from both sides, from Talbot County and from the shore, went to Gettysburg. There were like over 50,000 Civil War veterans there uh, for this 50th anniversary. And after that occasion, they came back. And that's when a committee was formed to raise funds to, well, there, there, there were actually, well, there was a committee formed to specifically do a Confederate monument. And there was a concept to do also a, a Union monument. But the Union monument never raised enough money uh, to, to get built, whereas the Talbot boys did. Any sense about why that happened? What I've read and what I'm seeing is that the folks on the Confederate side of the ledger um, had more resource and were able to raise the money. Folks on the Union side of the ledger uh, didn't have the resource. Um, I mean, a number of them were um, uh, U.S. colored troops who uh, who then re uh, who came back to Talbot County and Unionville was created as a place for uh, the, these folks to live, actually. And it just, you know, over a couple of years, they just weren't able to raise the money. And we, we will research that more as we get into this, because I, I want to know more about that. So when we're looking at um, the removal, um, what sense do you get about how that came about? Um, well, it, it there had been folks kind of pushing at that a little bit for at least five years. And I'm, I'm seeing evidence of where it even kind of goes back about 10 years. Um, specifically about five years before the move actually happened, um, the NAACP um, came to the council and Walter Black and Richard Potter, who I've both done preliminary interviews with, uh, were part of that. And they went to the council and said, can we put together a committee? to study the possibilities of moving the monument or doing, doing something different. And there was a 5-0 vote um, unanimously against even forming a committee at that point. And then over the succeeding years, it's like a, uh, pretty much every year, they would come back or other people would come back and 
the vote started to change. And bit by bit, it went, you know, to four to one, it went to three to two. And the thing that really appears to have tipped the scale and been um, a point where there was more of a change of heart, let's say, was when George Floyd was murdered. And there were what I would call organic protests, I mean, all over the country. But they, there was a protest in, in Easton that um, was really a reaction from, from what I'm seeing to a letter to the editor. And like the next day, all these people showed up and marched. And um, either that march or, or a subsequent march, and I'm, I'm not sure on the detail on that. I've got to check that. Ended up at the courthouse, and there's the Talbot Boys Monument. And my feeling at this point is that a lot of the outrage that was being expressed by people in Black Lives Matter um, got focused on that statue. And that became something they could do and work at, and they did. And that's when Move the Monument got formed. And they, you know, Denise um, was one of the leaders in that, and um, she's got... Uh, uh, history in, in uh, organizing people and she put her talents to use and they were able to do that and you know a lot of people even that I've talked to on the move the monument side of this didn't think they were going to be successful or certainly not in the period of time that they were successful and but they, they did things what I'm seeing is almost a textbook example of how you lobby a political body and and get something done and uh, it came to a point where the vote turned to three to two in favor of moving the monument and it went from there and on the other side of things preserve talbot history and, and i've interviewed um, you know, a couple of folks involved there um uh, they really formed that group as a, they didn't exist before that they formed that group as a reaction to move the monument and to try to resist what they were doing they were fairly successful then for a long time, though. I mean, do you, do you have any sense, I know you haven't interviewed a lot of people yet, but have you, do you have any sense about why they did not want to have that monument removed? Well, the thing I hear the most is, um, you know, it's their ancestors. It's, uh, it's, it's county history. And you hear the, you know, by taking a monument down, you're erasing history as, as one of the arguments. Um, there was, they were looking at moving it to another location in the county and, you know, people from move the monument were on board with that. You know, they just felt that the courthouse wasn't the right place for this thing. And they were not coming up with a location that would accept it in the county. I know they talked to, there's a cemetery there that I believe has some Confederate veterans buried there. They didn't want to accept it. Um, the historical society, which is downtown, um, but didn't want to accept it. Uh, there was a move kind of late in the game um, to move it to a piece of private property, and it's, it's a family who's – they have an ancestor's name on the, on the base of the monument, and they were offering their property. But things were pretty far along at that point, and um, the location of Shenandoah Valley at Cross Keys Battlefield had already been uh, selected and um, – and their, 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 the deal was worked out to be able to move it there, and the council just stayed with that tack. Here's one of the things that struck me. I, you mentioned uh, George Floyd. I know that um, I believe it was uh, Corey Pack initially voted for it. He's African-American, the only one actually mm -hmm. at the time on the council. And ultimately, of course, he changed his mind because of uh, George Floyd. And then mm -hmm. we have Frank uh, DeVilio, who also did the same. Have you, do you get sense about... about that process of how they came about saying enough is enough? Um, we haven't interviewed them directly, mm -hmm. and all I have is some secondhand information at this point. My goal, uh, we get the funding through this Indiegogo campaign that we're starting, is to, I would really like to interview all five of the council people who were part of, of what happened in that last couple of years. Um, uh, Frank Lesher, uh, has agreed and we just haven't been able to set up a time. Yeah, Pete. Yeah. Um, I mean, Pete, I'm sorry. Um, I'm confused. Yeah, I'm putting together <laughs> two names there. Um, uh, the others, uh, Frank DeVilio, I've been in contact with and we just haven't been able to establish anything yet. And 
in, in the last couple of weeks, we've been so focused on getting this thing launched that I really haven't been focused on trying to do additional interviews yet. So once we get past this, uh, we'll get back to that. But uh, if any of them are listening, this is an open invitation to all five of the council people who were there at the time to uh, to uh, please come tell us your stories. Because I also understand that there was a suggestion that perhaps instead of moving it, that they add a union soldier. Um, any sense about what happened about that? Um, yeah, I know people were talking, what I'm hearing, they were using the term unity monument. And I have seen a drawing of that, which was basically the Talbot Boys monument with a union soldier with a flag added to it. And at this point, that's about all I know about that. Mm-hmm. We're going to have to do more research about that and find out where where that headed. Um, one of the things uh, that came out in the in the interviews, and these were all brief, really preliminary interviews that we've done so far that are part of this pitch video. And um, Richard Potter, who was the president of the NAACP, I'm not sure if he still is in Talbot County because he's gotten a new job uh, in Delaware as a, as a diversity and inclusion uh, person in Delaware. But uh, the thing that he brought up was uh, reconciliation as being something that he thought would be a valuable part of this documentary. And, and I like that. I, I, and, and it goes back to the 50th anniversary of Gettysburg, and the theme was reconciliation. And, you know, where do we go from here? Because I think that the county and the town is still – pretty divided on this you know I, I it doesn't feel like everybody came together and sat around and sang kumbaya once it was over and and richard's very interested in the reconciliation part and i i am too i'd like to see where we can take this so um we're looking at, at I, I i'm hopeful that we can get into interviews about that and that maybe there can be some projects started in the county, whether they be arts projects or, or whatever. And that's um, we allude to that in the pitch video. A couple, um, mm-hmm. a couple of things that strikes me. One is um, that, of course, the statue sat on the opposite side uh, of the lawn from a statue of Frederick Douglass. And I understand, by the way, that when the Douglass statue was put up, uh, that it wasn't supposed to be any higher than the uh, Talbot Boys statue. But um, it does seem as if there, there was, was certainly, at least initially, before the effort to finally remove uh, Talbot's uh, boys that uh, they were at least moving towards uh, celebrating Frederick Douglass. Yes. Uh, you know, and there had been a move there. Um, one of the interviews, uh, Harriet Lowry, and, and she's in the, in the video, she tells a personal story. Um, she was involved in the, in the Frederick Douglass monument and they, they worked at that for a number of years before they got to the point that there was approval to do that. And they were looking at different locations and it, it finally got settled on the courthouse lawn. And yeah, she stated that that was one of the stipulations that, that Frederick Douglass could not be taller. The, the height of the monument could not be taller. But my one observation on that is they made the base of the statue shorter. So the physical figure of Frederick Douglass was taller than the Southwood boy, <laughs> even though the monuments are the, were the same height. And there are people there who felt that, that created balance, and that's their word. You know, that, uh, and I've heard that from several people that having the two monuments created a sense of balance. Um, but then, then, then we get to the point where you know George Floyd happens, and all these other things occurred. Finally, I wanted to turn to the particular history of this courthouse lawn because at one point it was a slave market. Correct. Yes, and there are there are photographs and there are descriptions of that. So. Uh, it, it seems as if that is sort of a, a poignant place um, for for people there. I know that uh, I believe it was there was a quote from the NAACP lawsuit which uh, said, "quote To Black Americans who enter the courthouse, in particular, the statue sends an unmistakable message that justice is not blind, and that the law does not serve and protect them equally." And that was the intent of the monument all along. It seems as if there's um, certainly a profound sense about the importance of um, this kind of monument. And it does seem as if looking, if we move back a bit, because you were talking about uh, statues, it does seem as if across the country we have begun to at least begin to uh, reckon with that uh, that particular legacy. Yeah, that's that's true. And, and that's what I really want to look at. I mean, I, I really want to do a deep dive into this. Um, what happened in the last couple of years with Move the Monument and Preserve Talbot History 
is, I guess, the tip of the spear, if you want to look at it that way. But the, the spear is a long spear. And there's history that goes back to, I mean, you can go back to 1619 in Jamestown, and actually the, the first slave ship came into where it's, what's now Fort Monroe. And so that's just down the bay. And you've got this history, uh, you know, through that, the, that whole period up to the Civil War, you know, through Reconstruction and Jim Crow and all the rest of it. And we want to look at all that, and, and uh, I want to hit on high points of that as they relate specifically to Talbot County and the shore and, um, and, and how all that comes forward to that period in, you know, 1913, 1916, when this monument was erected and what was, what was going on then around that. Because a lot of that's, – that's the spike in when monuments were built in this country to Civil War monuments was in that period. And it's not just Confederate. It's also Union monuments happened around that period. But on the Confederate side of it, the UDC, the United Daughters of the Confederacy, were very, very involved in that uh, it, happening uh, throughout the South. And of course, that that, that was also a period of probably the the height of at least the second emergence of the of the Ku Klux Klan as well. Um, are you optimistic uh, as we move forward in this country? Um, you're looking obviously at a specific statue at a specific moment in time and what they did, but you draw back. I mean, do you do you think um, you're optimistic about where the country is going in terms of these some kind of reckoning with the, this past? I'm always optimistic. <laughs> Um, Jeff Scher is a good friend of mine. He's a novelist that does historical novels. His uh, father, Michael Scher, wrote The Killer Angels. And, and anytime Jeff and I, well, not anytime, but there are times that we talk, and he just kind of shakes his head and looks at me and he goes, Wickline, you, you, you're an optimist. And, and I'm not <laughs> sure. I think, I think Jeff may be a little more cynical than I am. <laughs> but, uh, you know, and, but he's been writing a lot of war stories, you know, and he's dealt with some real, real tough subjects. Um, well, I, I am optimistic. You know, I, I I have to be. You know, it's it's like I can't live I can't live in fear. I can't live in you know feeling like things are just going to get worse. And I'm hopeful that this project that we shine a light on this in a way that helps people um, understand more, come together more, and um, th that it is. It, it's better. I mean, that's my hope. I, I don't. The last thing I want to do is make things more divisive. That's that's absolutely the last thing I want to do. We've been speaking with Mike Wickline. He is a producer and director at Magic Lantern, based in Baltimore, and he has embarked on a new project called Monumental Struggle, which is about the removal of the Talbot Boys statue in Easton. And we appreciate you taking the time to talk with us uh, this afternoon. Well, I really appreciate the time and your questions and your interest in the subject. You're listening to Delmarva Today. This is Don Rush. Delmarva Today with Don Rush.